Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the final talk of the 2013 Royal Tyrol Museum Speaker Series. Today, the Royal Tyrol Museum and its cooperating society are proud to present Mr. Thomas Lipka. Tom is an independent researcher from Westminster, Maryland. Tom grew up in, Mar in Baltimore, Maryland. His interest for dinosaurs and fossils began at an early age, and the fact that his hometown is built on Cretaceous bedrock only fueled his passion. After serving in the Army, Tom pursued his interest in paleontology and eventually enrolled in college, first obtaining an associate's degree in physical science from Baltimore City Community College, and then his bachelor's degree in natural history and geosciences from Towson University. It is during that time, and literally on the eve of Tom's first professional presentation at a conference, that he and his wife welcomed twins, a boy and a girl. Facing new responsibilities, Tom was unable to pursue his long-term goal to attend graduate school, but his job and the proximity of his home to the field made it possible for him to conduct paleontological research on his own. Over the years, Tom has made a number of significant discoveries, published several scientific articles, was awarded several research grants and awards, and established collaborative relationships with paleontologists from the Johns Hopkins University, the Smithsonian, and the University of Oklahoma. Tom is the perfect example of what an independent researcher truly is. Unlike am amateur fossil collectors who look for fossils to build personal collections, Tom searches for fossils in an attempt to conduct genuine scientific research, to study and describe specimens, to share his results through peer-reviewed publications and talks at conferences, and finally to donate the fossils to a museum so they can be accessioned in public collections. Thanks to his efforts, numerous scientific articles were published and previously unknown species of turtles and mammals have been discovered, the most recent one appearing in this month's issue of CJES dedicated to Professor Richard Fox. Today, Tom will present an overview of his work on early Cretaceous fossils of Maryland. So without further delay, I present you Mr. Tom Lipka. Thanks, Francois. Oh, thanks, Francois, and thank you all for coming. Uh, despite the wordy title, uh, which, it, which was harder to condense than it looks, uh, I, today I'm going to compare and contrast the travails and difficulties of uh, actually trying to do paleontology on the East Coast when you're uh, constantly fighting urban, this urban sprawl and development that's just metastatizing through the whole East Coast. Um, and it tends to destroy more, more outcrops and uh, fossil pro uh, prospects than uh, they turn up. And of course, those are only transient in nature themselves. Uh, so uh, in, the, in, the other, in the other concept I want to bring is, uh, hopefully, to really illustrate to you today uh, is the fact that from this one little site that is about a half an acre in area, and it's probably smaller now. Uh, we're, we're, we're finding material that is uh, new to science and, uh, and of significance to the paleontological community. And there's no such thing as lever right over there. We pick up, or I pick up, everything that I can find, every scrap of bone, because it eventually it leads you to something that better. And that's how I've been able to make some interesting discoveries over the years. So. Okay, here is our urban jungle. Uh, Baltimore is here, of course, Washington. This A is pretty much where Dinosaur Alley runs between Baltimore and Washington, D.C. Uh, Interstate 95 runs the entire East Coast from the southern tip of Florida all the way up to our border with New Brunswick, Canada. And it is along here, and actually along side roads in between here, where uh, Dinosaur Alley exists. Now, here's our nighttime view. And I got, this should hammer at home even better than anything else. Uh, a satellite at night view of the East Coast. Those are all street lights and homes and et cetera. There again, here's Washington, D.C. This blob is uh, Baltimore, Richmond, Virginia. A 95 runs right up that way. And then you're moving into Philadelphia and into New York and Boston. Uh, I'll have to add to this that as an amateur astronomer, that's not very conducive to uh, a, nice, a nighttime sky observation. So, I moved a little further where that little dot is at west, where you at least see the Milky Way at night. Uh, since many of people probably have not heard of the uh, Potomac Formation or the Arundel Clay, especially light of these vast resources you have out here, uh, I think it'd probably be uh, prudent for me to give you a, a crash course on uh, East Coast Geology 101. Hopefully, it's 101. Um, 
just like the province of Alberta is composed of uh, physiographic uh, regions, in the states we call them provinces, but since I'm in a province, I'll stick to the nomenclature. Uh, in the 600 kilometer length of, of the state of Maryland, uh, there are six of such physiographic regions. Uh, these are the more mountainous regions and really don't play a part in our talk. Um, the, the first Mesozoic sequence we run into is the Triassic lowland, and this is the southern end of the Gettysburg uh, formation. Uh, well, maybe I'll click on that first. There we go. And uh, my new locality or where I live is right in that area. So uh, that's, and that's a new research area that I'm starting uh, to investigate. Um, in this middle section is the Piedmont Plateau. It's all Paleozoic recrystallized metamorphosed rocks that uh, have no significance to us except how they play a part in this fall zone, which is a structural hinge that offlaps those, the, uh, uh, Piedmont, yeah, the Piedmont Plateau section and just deposits this sedimentary wedge right through in a, in a southeastern direction and underneath Chesapeake Bay and on the eastern shore. And the third part, which will be the subject of our talk, is the coastal plain region of uh, Maryland, and this is where all the sediments deposit uh, from early Cretaceous on up through Miocene and even younger uh, Miocene rocks are down here. And, uh, but most of the early Cretaceous occurs in a little narrow belt between here and Baltimore, again, Washington, D.C. here. If we filter all that out, this is the most interesting part of Maryland as far as I'm concerned, paleontologically and geologically speaking. Once again, this is the, uh, the uh, late Triassic 220 million year old uh, pa uh, paleo uh, preserved rift basins of the uh, Gettysburg Basin. And these kind of record the, uh, the initial stages of the opening of the Paleo Atlantic Ocean when, when the great continent, Pan supercontinent Pangaea, uh, was breaking up. The second and more important one is the, where the Arundel Clay and the Potomac Group are found. Again, this is Dinosaur Alley, right between Washington, D.C., and Baltimore. Outside of Northeast of Baltimore, if you, too far, if you, a couple kilometers north, and only a few kilometers south of DC, we lose this important outcrop, and that's because basically you have a bowl-shaped uh, de de depot center, and thickest sediments are in the center. And as, of course, as you go uh, across them, they eventually pinch out. So fortunately for us, that produced the uh, the, the iron ore that the original miners were looking for. And oops, look, there's some bone in here, and that's how dinosaurs were discovered. Uh, over a century ago. And uh, lastly, just worth mentioning, are this, these are the outcrops of the later Cretaceous and younger rocks, such as they are. Um, uh, they're, they're mostly marine in nature. You, the dinosaur bones have occasionally come out of them, um, like limb bones beat up stuff from the, something that died near the ocean and got swept out in the ancient Cretaceous tides. Uh, these are late Cretaceous, and these are probably closer in age to the dinosaurs you find here in Alberta, which are all terrestrial. And that's the general younging direction uh, from oldest to youngest. Uh, it really doesn't bear a, a geologic significance, just to hammer home the point of uh, which way we're going. All right, for a brief description of the Potomac Formation, and we'll focus just on the composite section, uh, it's a tripartite, just means three-part series of sand, silts, and clays, and there really are. They're not rocks, except for uh, in certain circumstances with the basal the toxin facies, which until recently was considered not very fossiliferous. Uh, it's a sandier uh, kind of matrix um, uh, and with highly variable in color as well. And likewise, the upper Patapsco facies is also con uh, consists of uh, variegated colored clays and sands. And when the two are together, you can't tell them apart, uh, like outside of the Dinosaur Alley, when the Arundel is missing. So the Arundel clay, when, when present, and like again, only in Dinosaur Alley, um, that serves as a marker, pre marker, not only a marker bed, but that is our fossil horizon that produces all the vertebrate material we now have. And it's being gradually subsumed by the urban jungle. Um, one other interesting facet about there uh, are these. One encounters occasionally these discontinued ledges of hardened sandstone and mudstone that contain, uh, often contain fossils, and that would be an interesting story about that in a minute. Uh, how the Arundel and Patuxent correlate with uh, other uh, stratigraphic units in North America primarily. Uh, we have the uh, 
Of course, again, the Arundel member is only known from Maryland, and I'm not entirely in agreement with this age, this correlation exactly, but it's close enough for government work. Um, this is the production Arundel faces in Maryland, and again, it's, the Arundel isn't known in Virginia, but it belongs to the uh, western part or the eastern part of what would become the Appalachia uh, landmass when the Great Bear Paul Sea Valley completes its intersection with uh, our meeting with the uh, uh, Paleo Gulf of Mexico and, and divides the continent into, into two land masses for a time and, and separates a pile of uh, a whole different group of uh, dinosaurs from each other. So they go all on their own evolutionary paths. Uh, then we have the Trinity Group uh, and the Antler Formation of Oklahoma, not met, shown here, Cloverleaf Formation of Montana and Wyoming, and Geving Formation of BC, um, and the Lower Green Sand which is part of the Wielding Group, another fabulous outcrop uh, of, of material that they're finding that some of those may, have, may be showing relationships to the, to the Maryland material. And you'll see that graphically in a sec. And this also implies that some, that some of the old connection, Pangean connections are still in the play, which means that the continents are still close enough together that animals can migrate back and forth. Uh, so the aptitude stage in Maryland click, there we go. Again, here's the star approximately where we're at, uh, just on the map. Don't worry about the tectonic thing. The, the, the thing I want to bring home here is the, are the continental connections. This continental ma land mass here is, is called Laurasia. Just, just means the connection between all North America and Greenland mostly connected. There's still one great land mass. Africa and South America had split away, and then, but you still have this connection. This is actually Iberia, or Spain and Portugal and England in there. This is. Uh, Paleo Europe and still physically connected with Asia, so it's called Eurasia. So, so there, it was still possible at the time of the Aptian when the Potomac sediments were being deposited for creatures to migrate back and forth, even through the seaway. And this is the Great Bear Paul Seaway. Of course, this place was underwater at the time my sediments were being deposited, well, my terrestrial sediments were being deposited. Anyway, so, and uh, this doesn't become complete until later in the Cretaceous, and that's where you get the two. Uh, Subland masses. So after boring with all that, let's go a little fossil hunting, okay? Uh, that's the whole point of this. I'm going to take it, it should, uh, hopefully give you a feel for what it's like to go fossil hunting in the East Coast, and it's not as glamorous and pretty as you might find here, but it's, it, it works. Okay, this is one type locality. Um, this to give you, a, not a type locality, but it's one locality that can give you a feel for some of the stratigraphy I just mentioned, I know it's yawning and boring, but here we have the variegated lighter clays uh, in, in a clay pit, as a matter of fact. It's been closed down, so one day this will probably be another shopping mall. But in this case, it's not as important to me, unlike the paleobotanists who I showed the site to, uh, who collected samples from it uh, for their studies. Uh, but you can see these light gray sandy clays and muds, and my interpretation of these are these, they belong to the... Uh, upper uh, part of the Potomac group, or Potomac formation. Uh, it's Patapsco Raritan, and for a uh, guide here, it's about where we are, just outside the city, <sighs> 10 minutes from my home when I lived in Baltimore, 15 minutes at the most. Uh, so technically, it's not part of uh, Dinosaur Alley, but it's still worthwhile to mention. And uh, we're going to be traveling south this way towards our target location uh, in a minute. That's where the goodies lay. All right. My first big discovery, though, back in the late 80s when I started focusing on and, and trying to find uh, dinosaur fossils, which was my own interest, the just theropods my, I've always been fascinated with. So I like carnivores, I guess, because I'm one. Uh, it was a site, literally another 10-minute drive from my house in East Baltimore, but a little further south and squarely in the Arundel formation sequence. And uh, over the years, about three years I've worked this site, I collected tons of beautifully preserved plant fossils in this really fine-grained, silty matrix, uh, but no dinosaur fossils, no vertebrate fossils of any kind. It's, again, it was another abandoned clay pit, which um, has been, since been turned to another warehouse, and the, seat, and the hillside was graded over and planted, so it's lost. Uh, but until then, we found uh, beautiful specimens of plant material, all in this clay matrix, and it's just like any dried clay you might have now, and if you drop it, it would shatter. Uh, so this, this glow on here is uh, spray polyurethane. 
I found it works really well if you let me make sure they're as dry as possible, and then they won't disintegrate years later either. And of course, since I run a low budget operation, largely funded on my own, uh, you know, Home Depot and, and hardware stores are perfect for, for the paleontologist. Uh, and of course, this, this, this is a fern, probably of the Platophlebus species of paleobotany is not my area, but at least I can recognize some of these. This uh, is a conifer, similar to like your arborvitae plants, uh, Phrenolopsis. And this is, these are fronds or probable fronds of what Fontaine used to refer to as Metasequoia, but he, he used the modern uh, reference to the red, uh, redwoods and sequoias of California for his description. But it's a taxodia species, and that's a frond. And of course, there's our little diminutive U.S. dime for scale. And once again, we're approximately at that location, just that side of the Beltway. Speaking of the Beltway, one day I just took, had to take a different route home from work. I can usually just cut through town. I live in southeast. I work in southeast Baltimore, and then I used to work live in northeast Baltimore. So uh, traffic drove me off into the Beltway, which is a loop around. It takes about the same amount of time. And I saw this construction site exposing about a quarter mile or 800 meters of uh, new outcrop. Well, the only thing here in this area, of course, is Potomac Group. And this is a, well, my interpretation of this site is a little bit different. This is more of a pond deposit, but it kind of exhibits the basic tripartite Potomac sequence that I would just I'm trying to make you familiar with, although this is probably, like I said, it's just a smaller pot deposit of like a pond or, or a side stream where you have this, uh, in this case, this is model clay. So this is the, the, the original surface before it became slowly inundated with the, uh, as indicated by this light gray is sandy clay. And then as this dark carb carbonaceous sequence uh, is, in the, is a deeper pond sequence with plant debris, but nothing distinguishable, mostly pollen again. Paleobotanists would go crazy. And then you can see uh, uh, water levels retreating and then advancing again, and then suddenly becoming exposed to the air again. That's the ox red is oxidized, black, and the darker black again usually means uh, anoxic. Um, another spot 10 minutes from my home. So uh, after about three weeks of sneaking there on Sundays when there's no construction, and they're pretty cool about it in the States as long as you don't like like you're doing something crazy, uh, that would be in that area of the city. And my interpretation would be more towards the end of the Arundel and probably part of the uh, Patapsco Raritan facies. But uh, this construction site is the result of, um, it seems like the, the, the people or the residents uh, who fringe the Baltimore Beltway, which is this eight lane anaconda that circles the entire city, just like the Capitol Beltway does with DC, uh, they don't like all that traffic noise. And it's too noisy now because, well, they, these roads get saturated in, uh, during certain times of the day, and I don't blame them, but they moved there. So they clamored the politicians for a solution, which were these big, <clears throat> so they call them aesthetically, aesthetic concrete slab walls that basically ring the, almost the entire inner circle and the outer circle of the beltway to keep the noise from bothering the, the residents. And... Here is the trench that they dug out. And in the previous picture, too, which is further down this way, this is looking north up strike along the outcrop. That's where they sink these foundations for the big slab walls that go up to about three, three or four meters, sometimes higher. Um, and here's our little, here, it's not little, here's our eight lane anaconda called the Baltimore Beltway, just on the east side on a Sunday. So traffic's light, but that's bumper to bumper traffic heading north up towards Philadelphia. And, uh, um, and, there was, and as they worked their way up the road, there was another outcrop just on the other side of this bridge, too, but it, same result. Um, moving into Baltimore City proper, this is right, actually, it, it, at the Inner Harbor almost. It's, it overlooks the harbor. It's in a, now an upscale neighborhood because they're building on it. It's a small site of probable Patuxent feces, um, which contains some bits of organic debris branches and some impressions of plants and a uh, yellow limonite matrix, which is just the hydrous iron oxide uh, mudstone, mud rock. Uh, but they're yellow in color. And this is a paleobotanist from the University of Oklahoma who I was showing many of these sites to on a real field trip, uh, collecting samples. Uh, he's about 5'8 for scale. So you, you're talking three or four meters at the most of outcrop exposure. And in this direction, 20 meters, meters or so. The irony here is that's a high school. 
there's the parking lot. Um, and people really literally don't know what they have behind them, and it's just an abandoned parking lot. So I, I could, I'd go here for lunch in my lunch breaks when I worked as a signal technician on the street in Baltimore and <laughs> go fossil hunting and poke around. Uh, that's changed too. Um, and here's uh, Federal Hill. Federal Hill is just north of the site I just showed you. It overlooks Inner Harbor, and the reason I bring it up and make a little impromptu plug for my hometown is that Federal Hill itself was once mined for pure white sands of the Patuxent Formation, or facies, uh, that made exceptional glass in the 18th century, or 19th century, too. Um, but now it's just a park with a cannon on it, because uh, we were worried about the British invading back then, too. Um, of course, there's our World Trade Center, our National Aquarium, and the Maryland Science Center is not in this view. It's just off to the left. Um, so there's our Inner Harbor view. And then if you move south, again, there's the tr World Trade Center up in this area. My site is like right off of here. And uh, I have to bring Fort McHenry into view in the play, only in the context because it sits on top of Cretaceous sediments. And I've often wondered uh, what the, uh, the builders that fort uh, encountered in the, while they made, when, uh, when they made that fort before the War of 1812 fame. But then again, there's your very looking up the Inner Harbor and <laughs> another view of the urban uh, jungle. Moving a little bit south of our target for a minute, um, we're going to go to a, a public park called Paint Branch Park that literally sits on the University of Maryland College Park's back door, as well as that of NASA Goddard Space Center. Um, and a, lo a local who lives in the Silver Spring area just outside D.C. Uh, discovered that in the, in the beds here, uh, in the stream bed here, where he was finding slabs of, or uh, with tracks of dinosaurs and eventually uh, birds, mammals, pterosaurs, just about anything that you can imagine would, that would live in a wetland environment in the early Cretaceous is represented in his um, track uh, fauna. And from what several investigations have revealed is that there's these little ledges, that's probably one right there, uh, and nestled in this condensed sequence of Patuxent and in Arundel. Um, oh, there's my 1.42 meter meter stick. And like I said, I, I, I run a low budget operation here. And that's just two poles joined together and taped. And I didn't push the two together close enough. So that's, they're supposed to be 10 centimeters each. Uh, but low budget operation, hey, you know, scale, scale. Um, back to the tracks. And uh, so it, it, over the decade that, since you started discovering these, we've been, we found that any of these little streams that cut along that fault line, I mean, that fall zone that I mentioned uh, in the earlier slides, and close to, uh, that cuts through this sequence tend to turn up tracks. I haven't had a whole lot of luck in, in that myself, but Ray has developed a, uh, an eye for it. And so once word got out of these tracks, a group of us decided to mount our own little field trip um, to meet Ray Stanford, who's the guy who's been finding them. The guy in the background is one of the preeminent paleontological scholars of our day, Dave Weissample from Hopkins. And this young fellow over here is uh, our, your RTM's own Francois uh, as a grad student. Uh, we made a couple of trips over the years he was there to examine his new finds and discoveries. Um, and this was the result of our, our one impromptu field trip with Dave and Francois. Uh, I used a Sharpie pen to highlight the paw prints. Again, like I said, the, uh, these are in the sandier mudstone and, or, and sandstone facies, which generally occur in the lo lowest or the bottom patoxin formation, below the arundel, but they're uh, stratigraphically in equivalent in age, uh, this, these representing something off in the, in the flood plain, whereas the, the, uh, the arundel material is more in the uh, uh, channels and back swamps and oxbows. Uh, and uh, we have a possible uh, ornithopod tracks here. Uh, again, technology is not my strong suit. And a potential, possible uh, um, Notosaur. Uh, I'll get to that in a minute, too. Again, they were discovered by Ray, and uh, it's a little bit of uh, sedimentology speak. It just means it's the uh, type of rocks they're found in. They're not found in Muirkirk. I have no tracks. The, 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 fa the, the facies are entirely different, and the depositional environment is entirely different. And again, the number of taxa in indicates fairly. He has representatives of all the material that I have in the form of body fossils, and then some in form of tracks. Finally, we get to my site. And here's the scale. Uh, the total length of the outcrop, which was about 200 meters in length, 
the total height of the, of the hillside, that 20, but the thickness of the outcrop of Arundel, which you can just see this black band coming through here in a recently opened section, is you know five or six meters in thickness. That is all there is on the east coast uh, uh, for the early Cretaceous. Uh, it contains some of the ancestors of the more common dinosaurs you find here in, in Alberta from the late Cretaceous, as well as some new uh, material that uh, are completely new to science. And of course, that opens the way for more uh, interesting research and collaboration with people from across the country. Uh, now, we focused on the other side of the side I showed in the beginning. Uh, this is our interpretation of the Muirkirk outcrop. Uh, the Arundel clay uh, is this dark band, uh, lower toxin facies, and you know, roughly up above here is the, uh, oh, let me go back one before I go there. Um, all this in front in the foreground used to be part of the, used to be at the level of that. It's been mined away for uh, bricks because this was an active clay mine for uh, brick operation. And I, over the years, I once I befriended most the, 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 uh, the uh, supervisor of the site, I used to try to tell him, why don't you change your name to Dinosaur Brick Company and sell dinosaur bricks? But they, they politely declined. But I, I just hate to think of how many bones were crushed into, and baked into bricks and, and sold throughout the, you know, the East Coast. But uh, at least we have, they allowed us to uh, prospect that. Back to there, back to the boring stratigraphy. Um, so this is where all the fossils come from. A um, couple things to bear out, you can see these black streaks throughout. Uh, they kind of like cut in, in at different angles and some are somewhat parallel. Uh, these are lignified logs. Lignite is just uh, not completely coalified coal, basically. Char uh, and it actually burns like that. The miners used to use this stuff for barbecue, uh, barbecues and you know, that kind of open fires on the, that on the, uh, in the quarry. Um, it's bounded by an upper layer of a discontinuous ledge of claystone sandstone, and these bear fossils as well so occasionally. And, uh, and as well, as a, there's a lower unit that's not as continuous as that, and then there's a little bit of a lag deposit over here. Um, and these, I don't know if you can see them too well, but the vault, the, there's rocks and cobbles all over here. I, I, I don't even call them cobbles. They're uh, mud balls and concretions. And these two often contain fossils. Well, rarely contain fossils, but most of the time they're plant uh, material that they concrete around. And uh, this, we'll get to this guy in a minute, but we found one of these guys in, in one of those concretions. Um, and again, once again, there's your scale. Uh, we're dealing with, uh, and in the pollen zonation just kind of really solidifies our, now, our uh, belief that we're dealing with the late Aptian of the early Cretaceous uh, uh, zone for, for the fossils. And uh, a little bit more boring paleo speak, but uh, the taphonomy of the site, and taphonomy is just how and why dead things become fossils or not. Um, it's a time average polygeneric site, which just means that it's an accumulation of dead things that get flushed into a deep basin over time. Some of the stuff, you know, or, and the rest of the stuff gets washed downstream or it gets fed on by uh, 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 scavengers and predators you know, whatever have you, and it's over a period of time, so it doesn't really give you, a, you know, a bad day in the early Cretaceous. It's someone's bad day throughout hundreds of years, probably, of the early Cretaceous. It, like I said, it tends to concentrate and jumble carcasses together, so we have no articulated fossils. And I'm, well, I was dying on my trip to Dinosaur Provincial Park the other day when, you know, hearing the story that you leave entire skeletons, out, uh, skeletons exposed because you have too many. You don't need any more. So, you know, again, you call it leverite. You know, I'm salivating over some of that. Um, we have no articulated skeletons of any kind uh, coming from, the Iran, from, from any part of the Potomac series of Maron at all. Uh, but we have, we have enough uh, bits and pieces to assemble some idea of the ones we do have. So anyway, the shifting channels, oh, uh, yeah, the, the concentration is the result of shifting uh, hydrological cycles. You have your, you know, like in any, uh, tropical environment, you have your drought, rainy season and your droughts. Things dry up, and then they get flooded out when the rains come. It changes sometimes the channel shift, and they get abandoned and creating oxbow lakes, back swamps. And that creates a stagnant environment and an acidic one that pretty much tears large bones up. It, it really selects out for smaller elements of bone and lots of teeth. I can, we got lots of teeth so, uh, of, of different taxa. And that's pretty much how we know what we know or who we know we have, what we have up there. 
Um, there's no evidence for them being carried downstream from anywhere because any of the broken bones have really sharp breaks and all the other bones are just clean and almost perfect as the day the animal had them. Uh, so they pretty much died in the area and avoided scavenging. Okay, some important finds. It's about time, right? Uh, sauropods uh, were the first dinosaurs recognized from Maryland. Um, it took a little bit to come out, but uh, originally in one of the bog iron mines in the Dinosaur Rally, some guy presented a dentist named um, uh, Christopher Johnston, some teeth uh, figured over here. Um, and after he sectioned him and, uh, through a mic and looked at him through a microscope, he came up with the name Astronon. Uh, that's one of the first dinosaurs named in North America, like number seven total, uh, after, this, after just 20 years after uh, Sir Richard Owen even coined the term dinosauria for these fearfully great creatures, or lizards. Um, Marsh and Hatcher came, uh, O.C. Marsh of the Bone Wars fame with Cope, and his assistant, uh, John Bell Hatcher, came in the 1880s and prospected and found dozens of bones and teeth. And I don't think you can really see it here, but these little dark spots represent what we have of whatever the sauropod is. And of course, since he found a sauropod, he had, he had believed that the Potomac or the Neuronda were Jurassic in age. But the paleobotanists, even at this time, were saying, no, it's, they're early Cretaceous. Uh, so they, they're on to something there in the paleobotany department. But um, Marsh named them Pleurocelis altus and Pleurocelis nanus, just because he found bones of small, small, small uh, sauropods and medium-sized sauropods. But today, after a benefit of about 12 decades of paleontological advances, we also know that, uh, and the fact that we can now distinguish between juvenile and adult forms, that we believe that most of this represents one dinosaur of like a baby and maybe a middle age, mid, uh, teenage sauropod that's represented by the material here. But there are at least two fem femurs that I'm aware of found at different locations that when scaled up uh, reach Brachiosaur uh, proportions, and of course the big giant long neck guy, about 40, you know, 10 or 12 meters long. Um, so uh, that's what we have, and and, <laughs> and of course Astrodon Johnson I, which is the formal name that Joe Lighty uh, gave in 1865, uh, is now the Maryland State Dinosaur. There we go. And this is um, Greg Pauls, another local Baltimore paleontologist and paleoartist, reinterpretation of what would be pl Astrodon or Pleurocelis nanus and, and Altus and an adult form based on this uh, femora that we find. Um, so, uh, and, a, and a little bit of a paleontological argument, there are those who don't even, who don't think Astrodon should even be uh, uh, used and favor sauropod indeterminate, not even Pleurocelis, because Pleurocelis is a form that's actually more common in the West, but completely different. And, um, but since uh, we have, you know, uh, Christopher Johnson and Joe Lighty came along and named these teeth, and these are some examples of my finds, centimeter scale on the left there, um, we favor Astrodon as the uh, proper name for our critter. And it's only, and not only one sauropod, not three or two. And this, um, Several years later, the Maryland Science Center, who now has their own dinosaur hall called Dinosaur Mysteries, that I played a small part in, uh, approached me wishing to repeat um, Johnston's findings uh, of, eight, of 1859. And I sacrificed a small tooth about a centimeter long, seven or eight millimeters across, where they thin section it, and then they look at it under a plain polarized and cross polarized light, which is just how you bring out certain mineral, uh, every mineral has its own optical properties in both forms of light. And, and what he found were these star-shaped patterns. You can't see it too well here in the cross-polarized light, but it comes out better here, and there's a close-up of one. Hence, and of course, it's star-like, hence the name Astrodon, so star tooth. Uh, and these things that really interest me, but I find it hard to believe they're, they're really annual, but these appear like growth lines, or, or you know, like you see in a, in a, in a tree cross-section. So it's another avenue for study down the road if we ever get enough that we can sample. Moving along, another legacy of uh, our paleo ancestors, O.C. Marsh, um, collected material. This is a type specimen at the Smithsonian, I note the date. Um, 
that uh, of a small diminutive silurosaur, which is a small meat eater called, uh, he called it Silurus chrysalis, um, and referred it basically on teeth of this size and shape, and this claw. Of course, again, Marsh, and Marsh really didn't visit the site very long. His able assistant, John Bell Hatcher, did all the work, uh, collected this material. He describes uh, that, he assigns that to Silurus chrysalis. Um, well, again, the benefit of a, a century plus 10 of uh, advances in paleontology and, the, and, of course, the discovery of a, a fearsome little meat eater of uh, the dromaeosaur family called Deinonychus comes out. Now we have uh, specimens from which we can compare to. Um, and the, these are not in proper articulation for all you professionals out there. I don't want to hear any groans. It's just uh, for illustrative purposes. Uh, to, to, just to illustrate, we have parts of the finger bones, uh, claw bone, and, of course, these nice teeth. And uh, one of the diagnostic features besides, and I'll get to that in a second, but the killer claw are the fact that these serrations on the back of the teeth are more pronounced than those on the front of the teeth. Don't show up well there. And we've got a bunch of those plus a few uh, premaxilla teeth, which are the front teeth, uh, that compare well to Deinonychus from Oklahoma and uh, elsewhere, which, is, again, is of Cretaceous age. And here over here is your run-of-the-mill museum, you know, gift shop copy of, of the killer claw of Deinonychus, uh, uh, probably close to true size. And when you compare it to our little guy here, the, it, it's just a little carbon copy of the big thing. Um, and the gen general distinctive morphology is in the back of the, uh, the, the call for, for uh, articulating back and forth on it and this uh, groove here as well. Uh, I call it a blood groove, but it's not exactly. But it helps them to grasp on the play, uh, prey and tear them apart, and this helps them to process meat into nice bite-sized chunks. Uh, and again, these are more of a silurosaur teeth, so we have it, it's probably evidence for a second theropod, and these more uh, uh, broad, uh, robust and broad-shaped ones are more likely assignable to our Deinonychus. We also have evidence for a large allosauroid. I said, yeah, I spelled it right. Uh, in the Cretaceous, uh, and when I first got involved in this and started finding these magnificent teeth, now this is an inch scale, so scale that up. Um, I used to take these around to the meetings, and as, yeah, every theropod expert I could find, you know, what, you know, what do you think this is? Oh, well, you know, what's going on with, uh, you know, with, with these kind of teeth? And they would say, oh, it's Allosaur or Oid probably in the terminate, and they'd refer you off to Marsh again. And, of course, our Marsh, still, you know, believing that the, uh, site was Jurassic in age, named the material, and there's bone material in the type collections of the Smithsonian as well, part of the leg bones and stuff, and some teeth, um, of an allosauroid. And um, the, again, so we draw comparisons with the western interior, mostly from, again, uh, the Cloverleaf Formation of Montana, but also uh, other, other units out west. Um, there's a large allosaur called uh, Acrocanthosaurus atokensis, originally discovered in Oklahoma. Um, and the teeth, uh, after studying the, the teeth of, the, of some of the mounted specimens in various museums and comparing those with mine, uh, and you count the dental serrations, the shape and size, this is a premax tooth that would be up front here, it's one of the laterals, uh, so it's are some of these, and these are broken pieces of much larger specimens. Um, they compare well with those of Acrocanthosaurus, so the, there's a grudging consensus that, yeah, we probably have Acrocanthosaurus in the Arundel. Uh, and this would be one of the last of the Allosaurs because uh, this would throw Marsh off, through Marsh off is the fact that most, a lot of the fa fauna in the Arundel have a lot of, are more related or more resembling the late Jurassic uh, fauna, like the sauropods and the Allosaurs, whereas the later Cretaceous is more, has a fauna is more composed of Tyrannosaurs, and, or, uh, and chylosaurs and ornithomimids. So, uh, again, we're like in between the both, but these are just late hangers on from the Jurassic. They will be soon extinct, and T. rex and Albertosaurus will rise up and take over until the meteor hits. Um, there's also, uh, Marsh is close, and he called it Allosaurus medius. So, at least he, he was in the right category, but it's probably Acrocanthosaurus. And that ex makes it a, you know, 2,000 mile uh, range extension for that taxon as well. Um, during my work, there was a, an animal called Neovenator, Neo was discovered 
uh, in correlative deposits in the UK, and of course there's baryonics, and I think there's a third, I haven't got it yet. Um, and of course, all the material is at the Smithsonian for comparison, as these are. And this one here, I'll give you a little anecdote, bit me. Um, early in my work, uh, Dave Wise sample opened up his lab and just let me have a run of the lab to uh, learn how to mold and cast teeth and prepare specimens and, of course, help me with my writing in the early years. Um, so I was, uh, was making silicone mold casts. Uh, molds forecasts of these teeth uh, about the time when Don Henderson was a postdoc there. And uh, everything was going well until I got to this guy. And it, once the latex dries, it's kind of like squeeze cheese when it comes out, and once it dries, it's really elastic. Um, I couldn't get it out of the mold. And I'm sitting there pulling on it, pulling on it, and I didn't want to destroy the, uh, either the mold or the, or the tooth by forcing it. But I'd gotten it out so far, pinched between my two fingers, um, that it just slipped out of my hand. Just, and when it slid back, it just acted like a bustle and cut me right between the fingers. I played like a st stuck pig for several minutes, and I'm sitting there hiding from it, so I didn't want all these grad students to see me like this idiot cut himself. But in retrospect, I could say I got bitten by an acrocanthosaurus and lived. Uh, Ornithomimids. Um, these actually show up later in the Cretaceous, and we've got a century of building this dinosaur. Marsh, Hatcher, Law, Gibbons, uh, and the whole lot and from the turn of the century found additional specimens as well as mining, mostly of claws and uh, leg bones. But uh, the white stuff here are, are casts made by, at the Smithsonian for me of specimens that have been uh, found previously. Uh, again, not in true articulating position, just for illustrative purposes. Up here are actual, these rusty red ones are actual uh, phalanges, well, not, not phalanges, but uh, uh, foot bones and um, Here's a femur, uh, femur of one. Uh, this is the upper hip bone. And we have a uh, calcanium, which is part of the ankle. There's another calcanium there in, in the, at the Smith as well. And an astragalus, which are all part of the ankle and lower leg. Uh, and meta, uh, metacarpals here. Um, we're slowly building up uh, what probably is an ornithomimid, ostrich mimic. And they're so called because of their superficial resemblance to ostriches. And the fact that they lack teeth and had a bill, almost, it's like a bird's bill almost. Although there is one now that does have teeth, but not important here. Um, and the, based on the, the size of these specimens, you can probably get a clue from the centimeters and inch scale over here. Uh, our Arundel on Earth and Miami, uh, if it turns out to, uh, to be that way, it was about three meters high and five meters long. It's a pretty big guy, but like I said, these are not common until later in the Cretaceous. So this could be an ancestor of the stuff that... Uh, of the, of the dinosaurs that are being found out here. Uh, moving down, uh, down the, plants, the plant eater side, the Ornithiscans, or the bird hip, and mostly herbivorous dinosaurs, we have evidence for three. Um, first one, I'll, I have no, no picture of because it's really um, you know, not all that interesting, but it's resembling Tenontosaurus species, which is a, the, Cretaceous, late, or the early Cretaceous sheep of the Western interior. Uh, it's a broken tooth of a dentary lower jaw. And um, which also, if, if it holds up or we find more, will tie in again with the Western interior with Acrocanthosaurus, Deinonychus, et cetera. Um, we have one notosaur, which is, are the cousins of the Crete late Cretaceous tanks called Ancolosaurs, but these lack the club tail. They just had some armor and some spikes. C Marsh again described it based on six shed crowns that were found back then. Uh, in my work there and a few others, we've turned up dozens of lots of broken crowns, or shed crowns, which means they break off during feeding or just wear out and fall out and get replaced. Uh, and all sorts of uh, wear series, which is another project I need to get back to. Uh, and then several years later, found this first complete tooth, and then that's the root. So you can, from that, you can actually start to scale up the size of the animal, and I haven't gone that far with it yet, uh, pending more evidence. And among which is this guy, up until now, there's been no armor material, dermal plates, scutes, whatever you want to call them, for, for our notosaur. So I used to go jokingly refer to our notosaur as a naked notosaur uh, until uh, we found anything, any more material. And Deinonychus has been shown to feed on notosaurs in the cloverleaf formation by, uh, as well, which is another, albeit possibly circumstantial evidence, but uh, interesting enough. 
uh, we have uh, our, our first scoop. And this thing's been completely permineralized into pyrite. So uh, I've got to get that taken care of so it gets uh, conserved properly because pyrite rot is the bane of many fossils that come out of acidic environments because it just, just breaks the bonds up and the thing disintegrates. Um, so that's uh, notosaurs are the, more of the early Cretaceous uh, fauna and the ankylosaurs come later. And uh, like I said, originally uh, from a few shed crowns. Now on the right here are two teeth, and since then there's two more been found, of another uh, interesting creature called, uh, related to ceratopsians, uh, like triceratops, but this one, a basal one or, or early one. Uh, and, and that's identified by the, uh, the shape and size of these ridges and the secondary accessory pockets in here. Um, and Brenda Chenry, uh, uh, Jim Kirk, and myself, they even all, again, you, you can hear the same theme from the Hopkins crew, uh, uh, did a study on it and found out that they, they bear strong resemblance to a ceratopsian. Um, this is Montana ceratops. It's a little older, but it's a, a neoceratopsian, so I use it for illustrative purposes. Uh, or if you're familiar with protoceratops, that seems to be what, they're relate, what, what the teeth coming from indicate. And here again, ceratopsians aren't supposed to be here. They're, they're, they're supposed to have migrated from Asia in the later Cretaceous coming through uh, you know, Canada and the Northwest Territories migrating south that way after the reestablishment of a land bridge between uh, Asia, uh, Asia and North America uh, came into play in, towards the end of the Cretaceous. So how did that get here and not find it anywhere else? Well, I, th I tend to believe, that if you remember the paleo map I showed you, they came over from uh, their ancestors and relatives or whatever came over uh, from the east side, from Eurasia, and migrated through Maryland. And of course, we're stopped by the Paleo Appalachian Mountains, possibly, which back in those days may have stood as high as, uh, the, uh, the, as the Rockies, but have suffered a quarter billion years of erosion uh, since, the, since the creation of Pangaea. And now they're barely kilometer sized molehills of their former selves. So anything can get over the mountains now. Um, moving to the lower fauna, we have turtles. And plenty of turtles, just any aquatic or riparian environment, which is this riverside, uh, has, has them. Uh, it indicates another taxon, it's almost a junk taxon, called Gliptops. And here's another uh, western form called Neom Achilles. Um, mostly bro broken parts of shell, plastron, which is the belly, belly uh, shells, and, and carapace, which are the back shell. Um, and, there are di and diagnostic features are these pits and some of these, uh, some of the yeah, to, uh, like orange rind or orange peel texture, uh, as you see on here. And uh, others are more little pustulos, little dimples, uh, which are ind indicative of uh, Naomi Achilles. And of course, we find some skeletal elements. There's some uh, arm and leg bones of whatever. Uh, right now, it's, you know, they get generally get relegated to the glib tops taxon, although there are valid genera in the Western interior as well as the Naomi Achilles. Um, and then one day, I was showing our young grad student uh, the Muirkirk site and then explaining to him that you can find fossils in some of these uh, concretions and uh, rip-up class that are, that are just everywhere. They're almost like ball bearings in some case. And as I looked up the show, and it, I, something stared back at me out of the, out of the uh, concretion. And then so realized after, hey, wow, we have a skull of a turtle. Now, this is the first skull of any kind that's, com that's complete minus the lower jaws, but uh, hey, you can't, you, know, you can't have everything, uh, of a, another line of uh, turtles. It turns out to be a new genus and species, and Don Brinkman came in on, and did the lion's share of the analysis of the features to uh, hammer, uh, to really place it in its context in, in history. Um, that increases our, turtle, our number of turtle genera to four, but there is a possible fifth one. We have a neurotic, uh, about a half, 50 percent complete skeleton of a turtle found in the 80s that is just like waiting around for someone to describe. And uh, so until that happens, we'll stick with four. But I've given it the name Arundelamese Dardani. Uh, of course, the Rundle, uh, uh, turtle from the Arundel Dardani after the uh, owner of the quarry who let me spend almost 20 years of my life at the site. Literally, I would go there two, three, four days a week sometimes. Uh, so being 30 minutes away from home, it was just great. Um, 
we also have, have uh, crocodilians and possibly atoposaurs. I don't think I showed any in there, but there's some really small teeth that people have pointed and say that might be a toposaur. Um, we have parts of uh, scoot or osteoderm material, like the back of the armor. That's part of the vertebrae. I don't know how I put that there. Um, finger bones, tail vertebrae, and teeth. And notice the inch scale for that side and centimeters on that side. Again, here, and, and they're all in all shapes and sizes. They're everywhere. Of course, the crocs would be being crocs feed on anything. Um, and two or three of these little strange button teeth um, that seem to belong to another line of mollusk eating crocodiles, uh, which, is a, which is strange, but we do have mollusks. I don't show them here, but we do have unio and gastropods, or snails, um, in there, uh, related to Bernisarchia, which is a, known from Europe. Um, again, there's a connection. And uh, moving to the f other f uh, aquatic fauna, because it's, again, it's in a, a riparian environment, just much like the Red Deer River, anything that lives along the floodplain of the Red Deer River is, is generally the riparian habitat and the creatures therein. We have uh, these two tooth plates from a lungfish, um, which is a, 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 an arundel first. And lungfish, of course, were these eel-like creatures that live, and they're still alive today, but in the southern hemisphere in the hot, arid environments. But that as their system goes and they drought and their, and their puddles dry up, it, they're able to like, encase themselves in wet mud and breathe air. Yeah, that's why they're called lungfish. But anyway, we have two tooth plates from this. And actually, in the collection at the Smithsonian, there's a giant one about three, three centimeters across that if scaled up would probably equate to a, a, a lungfish about five foot long. So there were some giants running around even in the waters. And we have sharks, weird sharks called um, hibernant sharks. Uh, these have, are awaiting description, and that's, that'll be coming out hopefully in a next year or two. Um, Hibernants are weird. Uh, they possess these saw-like, spiky, ray fin spines. And some of them, this one did, but I don't have the specimen handy, had a, a, a horn-like projection, a little curly horn off their heads. Uh, they were mostly marine creatures, but there are now more evidence is coming out from all the correlative units that I just showed you and more that hibernants were actually ranging up in the fresh water. So I, I don't know if they were anadromous, meaning they migrated in and out for breeding, or they were permanent, but they were, they're certainly here in this muck environment of the Arundel. And there's a scanning electron micrograph uh, shot by uh, Randy Nidham for me uh, in the early, late 90s, uh, the, the, in addition to helping us to uh, identify what, what, the, what type of hibernant, what species and genus it belongs to. Uh, and, uh, and, and the features of interest here are, of course, these, uh, these, long, these streaks and ridges and the, and the type of the base that the teeth are mounted up into. Um, that's all we know about it, but uh, these were globally uh, ubiquitous. So, uh, so we, we do have a lot to compare to. We just haven't not been able to do it yet. And they're all new. They've never been reported before. And of course, what goes in must come out. <laughs> um, Several years I've walked past these things, I, you know, more focused on bone and teeth, et cetera, et cetera. Then, you know, as you get to know your outcrop better, you, you start looking, wait a minute, there's something interesting about that. And a lot of these look poopy, for lack of a better word. Um, and you can see them all different shapes and curvature. And Karen Shins looked at a few of these and says they probably are, but, you know, we've got to work and do some uh, x-ray analysis on them. And they don't have any bone material inside because, of, well, A, because of the acidic environment that they were deposited in, as well as the really acidic environment of probable crocodiles that just who can consume and, and, and produce, um, extract uh, nutrients from everything they eat would mean everything they excrete is you know, just mostly you know, mud. Until one day a friend of mine that was helping me on a site found this p uh, possible coprolite with a uh, ganoid or garg type fish scale in it. Now it's possible it might have just been dropped on it and rolled in it in the Paleo River or Pond at the time, but it's also interesting to think that whatever it was was eaten and that made it through the uh, digestive tract. So we have all kinds of signs of uh, uh, prehistoric life from what they ate to who ate what and who ate who, and of course with the tracks that are in the correlative sandy facies, uh, we know there's a lot more there to, to look for, and that's one little site. Oh, which by the way, I guess to put it in better comparison, I could fit in this room. 
and then, or in any one of the box canyons out of DPP, and there'd be tons of room to spare. Um, next thing I have, one day, one fine day in May, I was prospecting a newly opened cut that actually I showed you in that slide. Um, walked past it, and I usually kind of try to be systematic about it. And coming back, I saw that's about how it was laying in the side of the outcrop. And I immediately knew it was a mammal. I just read a paper on uh, trichononons by Cefeli, and luckily I knew what to look for. And um, here's a close up for it it's of an extinct line of mammals called trichononons. Uh, named so for these tricusp shaped teeth. Uh, these are the premolars and these are the molars. Um, and that's the, the real specimen in my hand of how big it was. It's just very, just dumb luck in a sense. Um, so we, uh, we named it uh, Rundle Coated Non Hot Nine in, in honor of the now deceased, but another eminent scholar and paleontologist, uh, Dr. Nicholas Hotton III. Uh, of the Smithsonian, who without him I wouldn't have even been, on, been able to get on that site, and he, he supported my work right up until his death, too, and he sometimes would walk up and walk in from the long way and just come up and talk to me for a couple hours and help me identify things. Uh, God rest his soul. But anyway, um, the interesting features of this creature is this little feature called Nakillian Groove. It's where a cartilage called Nichols cartilage used to be. And uh, it, it, ter it turns out that this is a trait that goes all the way back to almost where the, where the reptiles and the mammals split off on their own evolutionary past because at one point they were. Uh, and so that makes it a more primitive, it's a primitive trait more seen in Jurassic, Jurassic fauna than in Cretaceous again. And once again, that's, we can see why Marsh got confused about it. About a year later after we announced our Arundel Conodon, <coughs> Conodon, excuse me, um, Another partial jaw came out, this time with no teeth, uh, but it does possess the Machelian groove. Uh, and the alveoli, which are just the sockets for these teeth, uh, have the pattern and, and are consistent with uh, now our known Arundel conodon. And um, so that extended our, that doubled immediately the number of mammals ever found. And it's turned out it's the, it's the microfauna that seemed to be generating the most interest and support than finding any dinosaurs, which are really, in reality, if we ever find an articulated specimen, then I'd probably die, because <laughs> it's just almost impossible. So, um, and until now, uh, I was still focused on dinosaurs, but then the bigger picture uh, just popped into view. He'd say, hey, dummy, you have an entire early Cretaceous paleo environment you can look at. So we're getting into paleoecology and uh, taphonomy and all the other fun br side branches. And then, like I said, once that the uh, Ronald Conodon discovery got out, uh, sparked even more interest in uh, working with Rich Cefeli at the University of Oklahoma. Uh, we actually finally did uh, started doing a, a concerted effort to dig up matrix, screen wash it in a two, uh, two a nested screen process to clean out, get rid of the most of the junk you don't want, fusine rocks, junk. And then you concentrate it in heavy liquid, usually zinc bromide or something like that dry them out, and then you pick them under mi microscope. So you're, con you're taking bags of matrix that probably weigh 20 kilograms, 25 kilograms or more, condensing it down to something that weighs one or two, uh, concentrating that out, and then you've got to pick it under a microscope. Uh, it's tedious and mind-numbing until you find something. And we hadn't found anything in tons of matrix, and I still have more to go through, until several years later when someone picked this guy out. Um, after some study, it turns out to be a multi-tuberculate, another extinct line of weird uh, mammals uh, named Argilomys marylandensis, basically roughly translated means mud mouse from the Arundel. Uh, it's not a mouse, though. It's just mouse, mouse sized. Um, and multi-tuberculates are named so because of their unique, well, two, well one, their main unique feature are these bumps called tubercles on, their, on the tops of their crowns. Uh, this one has six and hence the name multi-tubercular. Another weird feature are these P4, uh, fourth premolars. Uh, they're blade-shaped. Nobody really is sure what they were for, but most uh, multi-tuberculates possess that, and of course the multi-tubercle teeth. Ours is an upper molar, capital M means upper, second molar from the front. That would be this one, a correlative animal. This is Simoxamese, is distantly related. It's not even in the right uh, clade, but it's the best picture I could find to illustrate the approximate position where that comes from and what a multi-tuberculate is. 
uh, fascinating. If we can um, find more material to uh, improve on our knowledge of this, it'd be outstanding. Another a Rundle first, East Coast first. You know, it's a first for everything. Um, and we just put a paper out in the Canadian Journal of Earth Science. Uh, of course, I wrote, I composed this weeks, a week or so ago before it actually did come out. It's out this week. So if you can get a hold of a copy, you can read up about uh, all its uh, uh, features. Um, of course, it's a new specimen, and its placing is called, it's plagiolacid graded of early, the Jurassic and early Cretaceous forms that, um, again, attest to the ancientness of, of or ancient lineage of this guy, even compared to the modern Arundel fauna. And uh, it does retain some characteristics that hint at some taxa that have, been, that have recently been discovered in Spain. Uh, but that's all we can say about it. We can't really even call it anything more than uh, Argelomies for now. And then, so it still requires some more research for classification purposes. Uh, but of course, all this expands our knowledge of bio, uh, biogeography and the biodiversity uh, throughout the early Cretaceous. And of course, which also sets the stage for the late Cretaceous, like you have out here. And of course, kids, uh, without all the vertebrates, you got to find what they feed on. Um, here's just a small example of Muirkirk plants, not like the other ones I showed you in the beginning from the other clay pit that's now extinct. Uh, here is an in situ or in place tree trunk. It's been lignified, almost cold. And here's my 1.42 meter meter stick uh, for scale. Um, that's the only in situ uh, tree trunk I've ever found, but it's probably of the, one of the giant sequoia-like plants that there are trees that lived alongside the stream bank 115 million years ago. Uh, here's a rare light-colored sandstone matrix with a beautiful preserved acrostic opterus uh, frond on it. Um, it's just fascinating at the detail, but it's real fine grain, so that's why you can see it in such detail. Usually the fossils are in a matrix like this. This is basically an iron cemented claystone or ironstone, claystone. Take your choice. Uh, red is, is oxidized. It's, well, all of it's oxidized, actually, but just the different colors of oxidation. There's the scale of another smallish plant um, I haven't identified yet. But we do have a pile of these cones, and I've actually seen them in the museum out here. Um, of course, but sequoias have been around for 150 million years, so it's not surprising. We have, they're, they're fairly ubiquitous too. And of course, being over the water as they would, they're going to fall into the pond. And some of it sort of sink, get buried quickly, and, and then expose and, and become limonatized. And uh, so we have abundant plant material. And there's also fusane. Fusane is fossil charcoal. Um, it seems to be ubiquitous throughout, the, the, even in well, the the whole Fanner's oak, actually, but uh, there's, there's many of uh, charcoal deposits, which I use loosely here because the fusane isn't in a, any given horizon. It's just scattered throughout. It just looks like charcoal. It floats. When, you, when, you, when you're screen washing for microvertebrates, that stuff floats right up. You skim it off and get rid of it. That's how you know you have fusane. Lignite sinks. So and then you just pick that out. Um, so that's indicative of forest fires, uh, which is consistent with, of course, uh, highly or a very seasonal environment of drought and, uh, and flood. So uh, here's my model for the uh, Muir Kirk locality. Uh, again, uh, we have a nice, we have a riparian habitat, kind of like the Okavanga Delta and the, um, and, and Ornoco and, 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 and the, um, and the Florida Everglades, that as it dries up, crocs move in and widen and deepen these holes and concentrates life over here, it dries out, and any lightning bolt can touch off the fire, it sweeps through and wipes out everything on, on the surface, and then the flood cycle begins anew. And this is a beautiful piece of artwork by Mary Parrish, uh, advertising the, the new Backyard Dinosaur exhibit, and features all the taxa that I've just presented tonight, or today, and then some that we haven't had a chance to talk about. It's the wet season version. And so you might ask, what do I do for vacation? Well, I go fossil hunting the Calvary Cliffs. That's the, oops, go back one. Uh, Calvary Cliffs is this about 45 kilometer stretch of beach that uh, you can find beautiful 10 to 12 million year old fossils of sharks, whales, birds, animals, uh, elephants, or gonfotheres in this case, rhinos, et cetera, and sea, mat, and sea, uh, sea cows uh, along the cliffs. There you go. 
Uh, the cliffs literally drip at the fossils, and that's, those are not pebbles, cobbles. Those are fossils uh, of all kinds of shells, and, for, and it changes character as you walk up and down the beach. And this particular pla place had a concentration of gastropods called teratella and other type of clam. I, I thought there was a vertebrate in there, but I, I don't see it now. But anyway, that just illustrates how much is there, and they just drip out of the cliffs. This is our, uh, I guess, our equivalent of what you folks have here in the dinosaur lands. And when you get tired of doing that, you can go snorkeling. You can, if you can see these little brown streaks, they're sandbars. Uh, you can snorkel for bones and mostly shark teeth. And uh, I did that quite often, too. That was it's a very fun. You can go out over 100 meters in low tide or even more and be in OHS tight water. So it's safe and it's a sandy bottom. And uh, this, is a one, this is a result of one day's fine. Uh, Miocene shark's teeth. Uh, carcar or car it's not carcardon anymore, but it's megalodon. Uh, there's mako shark in there. There's a croc tooth. And uh, that's what I do for vacation, too. I'm always fossil hunting. I'm always looking down or up, never straight ahead. Any questions? <laughs>